Okay, so um, today I want to kind of uh, take this talk a, um, a couple of ways. Um, firstly, I want to talk about the, the thing that we built, Reality.io. Um, and then secondly, talk about kind of the Oracle problem more generally and some, uh, some, sort of some, some general problems related to um, Oracles that a lot of projects in the space run into. And then finally, make kind of a bold proposal uh, for something we call Forkonomics. Um, which is the next thing we really want to kind of get moving. So, uh, as you heard, we, we built Reality Keys back in 2013. Um, that was, yeah, the first smart contract oracle um, anywhere, and that was before Ethereum was a thing. Um, and we learned a bunch of things. One was that doing smart contracts with Bitcoin is extremely painful. Um, but another was that we'd assumed that a lot of the kind of data that people wanted would be... Um, stuff that you could pull from websites and from web APIs. And, that, and we thought that the Oracle problem was basically a question of how do we bridge the gap between some trusted website and a blockchain. Um, but what we found in practice is that um, a lot of those, we those web APIs, even if you trust them, turned out to be not exactly what you need for the, for the contracts that you're trying to settle. So um, let me say just a little bit more in, in case anybody isn't familiar with it, what the Oracle problem is. Um, so if you want to make a, uh, a contract, the, your blockchain can do all kinds of amazing things for you in terms of managing assets, managing, for example, if this happens, in this case, we should give these assets to this person. In this other case, we should give it to this other person. Um, but to do that, it needs to know some information in all the most interesting cases about the real world, right? So if you want to do a bet on who won this game, at some point when you come to settle that bet, you need to know who won the game. Um, if I want to ensure my office against burning down, then at some point I need to know, did my office burn down? Um, we, we've seen, we've had all these ICOs people have been doing that have taken the form of just dumping huge amounts of money on teams and then hoping that the teams then deliver what they're supposed to deliver. It would be a lot better if we could do that milestone at a time. If they don't hit the milestones, the money goes back to the funders. But to do that, you need to know if they actually hit the milestone. Um, so. That's the, the kind of problem that, that we need to solve. Um, and the, the, the approach that we've been taking is that we want to, since we're working on Ethereum, which is Lego money, um, we want to break this up into small parts. So some of the other projects in the space, for example, Augur is designed as kind of a vertically integrated prediction market um, uh, project. So they have trading facilities, they have creating market facilities, and they have a decentralized oracle. Um, but we, we like the idea of breaking all this stuff apart so that anybody can make a consumer contract. Um, that's the, the contract that is actually going to pull the data. Um, then we can use our, our part, Reality.io, which is uh, designed to get you answers fast and cheap. Um, and then finally, Reality.io in turn uses what we, we call an arbitrator contract, which I'll talk about in a second, which is kind of a backstop. And that backstop also we wanted to make kind of pluggable and to be able to use uh, different, different models. So for reality, oh, this is kind of what we were trying to do. Um, anything your contract needs to know, if it's widely known, um, if the public kind of know the answer to it, we want to be able to handle that kind of question. Um, we want to do it as fast as is humanly possible. Um, we want it to be cheap for the typical case. Um, and inevitably, when you're dealing with truth about the world, inevitably, there are some things that are expensive. Sometimes something's contentious. Um, sometimes you need to, um, you know, to have a, have a com kind of complicated discussion about the right answer. But we want those expensive parts to be funded by idiots and liars. And we want to incentivize honest and you know, accurate um, providers of data to use the system. Um, obviously, we want, we want the gas to be as low as possible. I always feel kind of icky if I have a, a function that uses more than 100,000 gas. Um, so we've got nothing in our system that uses more than 100,000 gas, typically. Um, and just to make it as simple as possible for, um, for consumers, for, for contracts using the system, we want blockchain, blockchain only, so uh, no Swarm, no IPFS, just a contract call. Um, the data lives in event logs or in contract storage. Um, finally, we don't want to have to use funny tokens. Um, so Reality.io works just with Ether. You don't need some Reality.io token. Uh, we, we know probably your users have got Ether. Um, they need Ether to pay for gas, so we want to do the whole thing in Ether. Uh, we, we, we have had some consumers have asked us to support other tokens, which we have done for them, uh, but you don't need to do that. So this is what we built. This is kind of the DAP front end. 
Um, so you can put in any question you like, um, and it's all based on this kind of economic game. You put in any question you like, when you put in that question, if you want to, you can put up a reward. So this is money that, um, that is going to be uh, taken by whoever gives the final correct answer. And then, when you, and then anybody who wants to can then answer that question. But when they answer it, they've got to post a bond. And uh, posting a bond then sets a clock ticking. If nobody challenges that, then that's your final answer. Um, but if you see an answer that's wrong, you can go and challenge it. But when you challenge it, you, you're going to double the bond. Um, so if it's a contentious issue, the bond is going to keep on doubling and doubling and doubling until somebody gives up. Um, now, now, you're probably listening to this and thinking, OK, if somebody shows up with just a huge pile of money, then they're going to be able to, to give the, the final answer to everything, which would be bad. Um, but what we then do is we have uh, an arbitrator, a backstop. Um, and this is a pluggable contract. I'll tell you in a, in, in a second the, the kind of ways we can do this. Anybody can pay a fee to request arbitration. Um, and it's typically going to be quite a heavy fee. Um, and when, when they pay that fee, automatically the arbitrator contract sends a message that freezes the question and waits till they report. Um, so this costs a lot of money, but the idea is that an honest person shouldn't have to uh, end up being out of pocket. Because if you see somebody's put the wrong answer in, you can just keep on escalating the bond. So even if the, the arbitration fee is, let's say, $10,000, um, you can just keep escalating until the other guy has put up a bond above $10,000, and then you can pay the fee and then uh, get it resolved in your favor and make a profit. So what this allows us to do is it make, allows us to make the arbitration process uh, very expensive, very slow, use funny tokens if you want to, um, and, the, and these will make it much easier uh, to do arbitration. So, so, so let me talk a little bit about the approaches that you can use. Um, you can use trusted third parties. Now, obviously, that's not really what we're about. Um, when we originally built this, this was before um, Augur and Kleros had shipped, and we weren't sure if anyone would even really get anything working um, to do this in a decentralized way. And right now, it looks like um, Augur and, and Kleros are both working pretty well. It seems like the decentralized approaches are, are very um, promising, so you may not want to use trusted third parties. Um, but I think there are some special situations, especially even situations where you may want to actually pay somebody to go and gather information. So if there's a dispute about my office, whether my office burnt down, maybe you want to actually send somebody to go and find out whether my office burned down, actually check and look at my office and see if it burned down. Um, so then we've got Kleros. Kleros have, have made an integration. So they've made a, an arbitrator contract. So um, you'll send the fee to Kleros. And so this is kind of, an, uh, for people not familiar with it, it's a decentralized court system. Um, it's not usually going to be, it's gonna be, not going to be fast or inexpensive. It's going to be kind of expensive and potentially slow. It involves a lot of humans um, playing a kind of a shelling game to, to agree on something. Um, but in this case, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be fast. It just has to, has, has to be good. Um, so they, they've built this, um, this arbitrator contract. So you can use Kleros as the arbitrator. Uh, the vast majority of cases will just settle with Reality.io with our escalation game. But in these exceptional cases where somebody escalates and pays the fee, we go to Kleros. Um, then there's a, a really exciting thing that some uh, Gnosis guys are working on. There's a project that's just been, uh, been funded. Um, so we're going to have this thing working with Gnosis at both ends. So, um, so we'll have some consumer contracts working with Gnosis so that your Gnosis markets, your conditional tokens, can um, use Reality.io as a, as a source of data. And then at the other end, Gnosis have their DAO, the DX DAO. Um, and the DX DAO is responsible for upgrading um, contracts in, uh, in, in, in the, the things that it controls. So in some cases, you already have kind of a trust relationship with that DAO. Um, so, that, so you can then also use the DAO to, um, to resolve these contentious issues. Um, Again, it's, um, it's quite an expensive thing. It involves a lot of humans to talk to each other and, 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 and vote and, um, and work out what the right answer is, but that doesn't matter because it hardly ever has to happen. Um, you can use Augur. Now, we, so we built a, a connector that would send um, things to Augur for disputes, and some of the developers at Augur got kind of cross with us uh, for, reasons which are, for some good reasons, which I'll explain. Um, you may wonder why, why go through reality or why not just use Augur directly. Um, and the reason is that Augur is really, um, is really designed to work with their kind of vertically integrated system. It's not really designed as a general purpose oracle for other contracts to call. 
So right now, one of the um, con one of the uh, the projects that's using reality a lot called WeTrust. Originally, they built the thing to use Augur as their source of truth, um, and they found it was just too expensive and too slow and too cumbersome to use for that particular purpose. It's just not what Augur was designed for. Um, and, and finally, I'm going to talk in a little bit about Forkonomics. This is our, our grand plan for a new kind of meme money, um, and, and this is a, a way to resolve some of the, some of the problems that all of these projects face. So I'm going to go into specifics a little bit, and then I'll kind of broaden out and talk about um, more sort of game theoretical problems to, to do with oracles. So how you'd actually use the thing. So the simplest way is like this. Um, you go to the DAP, and you use the DAP to put in a question. When you put in that question, you get a question ID. You can then set up your contract to use that question ID. So you might say, um, if, the question, if the answer to the question ID, ABC, is true, then Alice gets the money. If it's false, then Bob gets the money. Um, so that's pretty simple. You, you can then just call it like this, get final answer, passing the question ID, um, and it'll give you a byte 32 back with the answer, or it'll uh, revert if the answer isn't available, if the thing isn't finalized or whatever. Um, if you want to answer the question with your contract, you can do it like this. So it's just a fairly simple function call, uh, returns the question ID we just mentioned. Uh, so we call ask question, we pass in a, a template ID, uh, which I, I won't um, go into, um, the content of the question, the arbitrator that you think is OK, and the timeout period. So remember, we had that challenge timeout after you put in an answer. How long do you have until we consider that the final answer? So uh, you know, typ typically, you, you'd use something like a day for that or a week. Um, but in, in some contexts, you might have a lot of people online all at the same time. And you might want to actually run this really fast in you know, five or 10 or 15 minute uh, challenge periods. Um, sometimes you don't actually know when a question is going to resolve. So if I want to look at whether my office has burnt down, then maybe it didn't burn down yesterday and it, it, it didn't burn today, but maybe it'll burn down, burn down tomorrow. Um, and I don't want to just set a really long deadline for this, right? If I've got an insurance thing set up, um, I don't want to have to wait till, say, the end of the year uh, to check if it's burned down and check if, it's, uh, if I get a payout. I want to immediately prove to the system uh, or prove to the, the, the insurance contract that my office has burnt down um, and then use that to immediately get my payout. Um, so what we can do there is that the insurance contract, instead of looking for a specific question ID, would look at the content of the kind of question that answers uh, the, the, the issue it's interested in. Um, so we pass in there the content of the question, has the office burnt down, the arbitrator ex it accepts, the um, minimum challenge period it thinks is, is okay, and the minimum bond that has to be staked against that answer to prove that it's good. Um, so if my office is burnt down, I can then go into Realtio, create this question, let the world see it, give the world that, um, that day to challenge it if they don't think it's burned down, and then take that question ID, pass it to the insurance contract, and get my payout. Um, I'll skip through the formatting question stuff, because that's all kind of in our, in our documentation. Um, it's maybe more detailed than you need right now. I should say a little bit about things that won't work. So we need the blockchain to be available. This is something that anything that relies on challenges uh, tends to have this problem. Um, a lot of layer two systems also that um, if somebody puts in the wrong answer, you need to be able to get your correct answer in to challenge it. Um, and we, we've tried to just make the gas cost as, as low as possible on correcting bad answers um, so that you, um, even if you're fighting against a blizzard of um, of spam or something, you can still get your answer in. Um, but there is no guarantee that the blockchain will always be available and that you can always get your transaction at a reasonable cost. So, so, so there is a potential problem there. Um, it doesn't work well with very ambiguous answers, with questions with a lot of potential answers. So the way that you correct a bad answer is by putting in a good answer. Um, but if there are three different options that might all be right and you're not confident that any of those are good, then you may not be prepared to... to um, to fix bad information. Kind of tricksy questions, you know, questions referring to some URL that's in, in the control of somebody. Um, we've seen a bit of this on Augur that there are people putting in, you know, deliberately, deliberately misleading questions. And this is potentially a, a, a problem for the system. And finally, the, ar the arbitrator has to work. So, so let me talk about the arbitrator working. Okay, so. Anything that relies on economic security, um, so pretty much anything that's relying on token holder voting, 
um, and also kind of things that are, that are relying on you know, the, the cost of, of mining, has this same issue that um, there's a certain economic cost to breaking the system or to act, to act maliciously um, with the system. Um, and you have to hope that the cost to doing something malicious is higher than the cost of, um, uh, is higher than the, than the benefit that you can get from doing that, right? Um, so if you're dealing, so, so the simplest case is um, a, l a lot of token control systems can be 51% attacked. So if you buy up more than half of the tokens in the system based on some kind of token voting, then you can make that system do whatever you want and say whatever you want. Um, so if somebody's put up a bet, um, if there's money at stake that is higher than the amount it costs to attack the system, then you should probably kind of assume that somebody's going to do that. Um, so, so this is kind of a fundamental problem, yeah, also with proof-of-work um, systems. Um, and, and if the system is badly designed, then it may be worse than that. But at least the best case generally is that you know, a 51% attack can, can do you damage. Um, so there are a couple of approaches to this. One is just to say, well, let's hope it doesn't happen. And that's kind of what Ethereum does, right? I mean, um, th there's, there's all this money at stake in, um, in DeFi applications right now, and it's quite plausible that it may be profitable to do a substantial rollback of the chain, uh, to do a 51% attack and, um, uh, and, and make some money like that. Um, so I, I think it is actually a, a kind of a not insane solution to just say, well, let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's just hope that the amount of money at stake, um, the, the, the cost of attacking the thing is less than the, the benefit of, of attacking the thing and it won't get killed. Um, Org are trying to actually manage this security, what we call the, the security load, the security burden. Um, so what Org do is, um, it actually keeps track of how much money um, is staked on bets inside the Augur system. And if you try to stake too much money in Augur, compared to the value of all the Augur tokens, then Augur will raise its fees, which hopefully will um, reduce the amount of money that gets staked, and also increase the profitability of holding the token. Um, so, so that way you, you push in the right direction in, in both directions um, and you put this thing back in balance. Um, and that worked great in, a kind of a in, in this kind of hierarchically integrated system um, where the, there's no actual, no, there's, there are no other Lego pieces and there's nobody else relying on that information for their bets. Um, but the problem is that there's no way to actually know um, not only can you not prevent this, you can't even detect it. Um, so it could be that um, a couple of people have made a, an enormous bet on Augur. Um, they could have done it with a counterfactual contract so that Augur is only the backstop. And um, unless something weird, weird happens, you never actually call Augur. So this code may, may never even go to the blockchain. And yet the incentive structure is still there that would make it worthwhile to attack Augur. Um, and, and what's worse is that potentially if this does kick in, you actually increase the incentive to make these parasite systems. Because if you put the fees up, then um, I could uh, pay the higher fee, um, or instead I could go off and use a parasite contract and not pay the fee at all. Um, and, and that means that the profitability of, of Augur actually decreases and then pot potentially you get kind of a death spiral. Um, so this is kind of this fund fundamental issue that, that the Augur guys acknowledge. Um, so, so it's just kind of a, 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 a sort of an unsolved problem. Um, so there is a strategy, we think, which can kind of um, escape this equation. Um, but it's a little bit weird and it has some limitations. So th this is the thing that we'd really like to get kicked off. Um, so uh, uh, Vitalik talked about this concept of subjectivocracy. Uh, we've been referring to it as forkonomics. Um, the, so so the, I guess the easiest introduction is, if you think about times when instead of, instead of having a dispute about facts, people were having a dispute about governance. Um, so when we had this disagreement about whether we should um, revert the money that was stolen from the DAO, um, we ended up with, since we had this kind of intractable dispute, we ended up with some of the people used ETC and changed the rules, and didn't change the rules, and other people used ETH and did change the rules. So when that happened, if you started with money before the fork, if you started with one ETH before the fork, you ended up with one ETC 
and one ETH after the fork. Um, and this gives you this kind of weird kind of security that it doesn't matter what the majority does, you can always be sure that there will be a chain that reflects the world as you see it, if you're prepared to, uh, to or at least if there isn't, you can create one. Um, and in a lot of cases, we think that the correct decision is going to be the more valuable one. So in a lot of cases, people can then look at these forks and say, okay, this is the one that's got more money behind it, therefore it's, uh, it's true and correct. Um, but that may not be the case, and that may, may not be the case for a particular time. So if you try to get objective information out of these systems, um, there is still this sort of security burden, this risk that it can be attacked. Um, but the other thing that you can do is just not assume that you're going to get objective uh, truth out of the thing. Everybody can use the chain they want to use, and you can just carry on using the thing. Um, so that's effectively what's happened with, with um, ETH and ETC. Um, so the thought here is, what if we do that, but instead of doing it with uh, governance, we do it with truth, with, with facts about the world. Um, so in, if, as a kind of a naive way of doing it, this would be that every time we have a question, we would fork. So if you want to say, did our office burn down, you fork your uh, token that you've made the insurance contract in into two versions. One says that it did burn down, and one says that it didn't burn down. Um, and then probably if it did burn down, everybody knows that it burnt down, then they won't be very interested in taking the, the version of the, um, the token that says it didn't burn down, and all of the value will go in, into the, um, the one that's correct. Um, if it's a, a fundamental kind of a worldview difference, it's possible that you will have enduring forks and that you'll have in, in, an enduring split. Um, but that's okay. But, but what you're probably thinking looking at this is, okay, if you do this with facts, then there are 100 million, gazillion, trillion facts, and then some. So we're going to have just this vast forest of forks, which obviously wouldn't be practical. Um, but what we can instead do is we can commit our token to a white list of arbitrators. Um, so so one, one branch might say that um, Kleros and DXDAO are OK. Um, and then the other branch might say, I think that DXDAO just got attacked. So you shouldn't believe the information that you get backstopped by DXDAO. Um, so if we do that, since we don't have these um, issues about is this arbitrator good anymore, since those issues don't happen so much, we don't get some crazy forest of forks. We should get kind of a, a reasonable um, a, amount of forking. So that's what I really like to see happen. We need this kind of grand forking token curator registry of arbitrators of truth. Um, you have a token committed to a whitelist of good truth sources, good arbitrators. Um, we can model all this stuff inside a single contract or in different contracts on a single blockchain. So we don't need to fork Ethereum. We don't need to do anything at kind of the base level. Um, we can do all, the thi do, do all of this modeling on top of um, the existing single Ethereum chain. Um, whenever you want to change the whitelist, you can just fork off the thing. Um, so we've been doing some, uh, some prototyping with, uh, with Alex Herman over there, who, who's going to be talking later today. And he, he also pointed out that, um, that we can also support other assets on this same forking universe. We're not limited to uh, a single token. Um, obviously, the limitation here is that since your token can fork, it's not going to work with, actual, with tokens that actually um, reflect some objective thing in the world. So if you're trying to manage who owns my house, only one person can own, own my house. We can't actually fork the house. Um, so you're limited to dealing with um, things that exist kind of purely in the sort of the, the mimetic blockchain universe. Um, and, you, and you also can't do things like stable coins, um, where if you, if you try to split fork Ethereum, um, potentially, if you're holding DAI, weird things might happen. You may end up with no DAI or two DAI or who knows. Um, so, that's what I'm proposing, it's kind of foreconomic, meme money. Um, the way I think this should work, we, like we could do an ICO and be, make it kind of our project token, but I feel like it should be, we, we want Lego money, right? We want all these composable parts talking, talking to each other. So at the risk of being grandiose, I think this needs to, to be a token shared across the whole ecosystem. We don't want one project in control of it, because if you look at actual um, token, actual currencies that are forked, in practice, BTC, BCH, BCH, BSV, ETC, ETH. In practice, actually, the core dev team always kind of wins. So it seems like you probably don't want a core dev team. You need it to be very distributed and very anarchist. 
Um, and we need to somehow, we, we've got all the, kind of the parts are all working. Um, Alex has got the, um, ha had a, a prototype of the, um, the, uh, the, the um, conditional uh, token that, that Gnosis uses to, to, to handle this uh, method of forking. Um, so we, we've got all the bits, but we need to somehow mean this thing into existence and maybe get some other projects using it and, uh, and make this really weird kind of money. Okay, so uh, I hope that's useful to you. So we've got Reality.io, it's on mainnet, it's, it's tested, it's live today, you can use it. Um, we've got the Forkonomic money, which is really weird and very interesting. Um, I've put a few links up at, uh, at Reality.io uh, slash Dapcon. Um, please come and talk to me later if you're interested or, uh, um, or jump, drop by our Discord and uh, um, let us know if you've got any questions or comments. Okay, I'm gonna have some questions. Here. Thanks, Evan. So we have time for a couple of questions. Um, if, if folks have questions from the audience, over here in the yellow, yellow jacket. Okay. Hello. Thanks for the presentation. I want to ask about, uh, can you explain more about arbitrators, entity, who are these guys and why we have to trust them? Right, so, th so, the so the arbitrator is a contract. Um, it can be any contract you like, and those contracts have, have different models, right? So if you're using Kleros, you use Kleros because you think that Kleros is um, crypto, crypto economic um, shell, uh, shelling, point design, shelling game design is good. Um, so if you think that Kleros is, uh, is a, 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 um, gonna be a functional sy functioning system, then you can trust it. Um, if you're using Augur as the arbitrator then, because you, you think that Augur's crypto economics works. If you're using, for example, a consortium of trusted parties, then that may be re regular um, real world uh, reputation. Um, however, all that said, if we do the forkonomic thing, then you don't have to trust the arbitrator. Because if the arbitrator um, starts doing things that are wrong, then the economy can just fork around them and ignore their bad data. Um, do, does that make sense? One more, one more question, and learning from experience, try to speak extremely clearly and not too gravelly, and we can hear you up here. It's quite tough to hear. Who's, anyone got their hand up? Okay, no problem. Thanks very much, Edmund. Okay.